Hi everybody, it's Adam Key for one last time, and this time I'm critiquing Christopher Outson's paper, Cluey and Critical Rhetoric, a critique of freedom and domination in Chris Cluey's Wasful Cockmonster letter to Emmett C. Burns. Now, specifically, you know, the goal of this overall critique is to look at essentially the idea of taking this document, which is rather well written, and turning it to a publication, either in a journal or textbook, or obviously, you know, maybe for a presentation at a conference. Now, one of the things the articles discussed is the idea of you know originality, but also the idea that essentially a good rhetorical piece should be justified in how it has an impact, how it relates to us. Um, this is actually the first issue I really have with the paper. Uh, primarily, and I actually believe, um, since I was the one who did the initial discussion, or initial critique on your justification piece, I believe I brought this up then as well. Uh, you do a good job of justifying why Cluey's critique was good for the people of Minnesota and why it impacted the people of Minnesota, but that's pretty much all you do. You talk about Minnesotans for equality, you know, he's a member of the Minnesota Vikings, but... I'm not really seeing a whole lot of work here, and I really would like to see some more done on the idea of how it impacted, say, the gay marriage discussion on a national stage. Because if it's only going to affect the people of Minnesota, then you may, you know, be able to get some you know, regional conferences or regional journals. But you know, I think this piece could definitely go national. You just need to do a better job justifying why it has an effect on the national discourse and not just the discourse on gay marriage in Minnesota. Um, the idea that Minnesota, yeah, was a hot topic or hotbed for that is definitely important, but I don't think you can really hijack uh, the importance of uh, Minnesota's gay marriage vote to you know echo that Cluey's was important in the nation. I think you need just a little more work done there. Um, secondly, I want to look at this whole concept of uh, Macaro. Uh, basically, you know, I, I think you do a really good job. In fact, I think you do co uh, too good of a job of explaining Macaro, this whole critique of domination, critique of freedom. Now, the thing is, a, a person who's a rhetorical scholar is likely to be somewhat at least familiar with this. So I think what you do is you give a little too much of, I guess, a history lesson on here's who Macaro was, here's what he wrote, here's what people wrote about him, here's what he wrote back. Honestly, this, this could really be shortened a whole lot. Uh, conversely to that, though, what I, a section in your, your background, your context, I, I think definitely needs a lot more work, is this idea of queer theory. Uh, I invite you to uh, go read Katie's paper. I'm sure you have since you had to do a critique with that, uh, that as well. Katie does an excellent job of really explicating what queer theory is and what queering is. Because if you just look at this whole balance issue, you see that you, you spend a whole, whole lot of time talking about Macaro and probably too much detail in there, but not a lot of time discussing queer theory or really what queering is. Now, I know what queering is, but somebody who's reading it might not know. Now, let's uh, let's get to this uh, the concept of masculinity. I, I think you do a really good job talking about you know, what it is to be masculine, although I would have liked to see a little more detail on the idea of masculinity being uh, I guess inherently heteronormative, um, specifically a little uh, more work done in that area, because that's really, you know, a, a key point uh, to your argument, and I believe, you know, all rhetorical critique is really, you know, face as an argument, is the idea that, um, basically, that here we have football, and football promotes masculinity, and masculinity, therefore, you know, says homosexuality is bad and homosexuality is feminine. You, you needed to do more than, I, I think, just a single source citation to really prove that. Uh, specifically on page 10, you say Bur uh, Burns directly stated that football was about the sport and that, I hope that I'm saying this right, I am Badejo, or Badejo, whatever, uh, had no role in political discussions, thus reinforcing masculinity is primarily physical and violent. Okay. This is kind of, you know, again, this whole discussion of masculinity, I, I think you could have, you know, benefited from a little more discussion of what is masculinity, how is it defined uh, before this, because this is really the first mention we get that masculinity is not something that can approach political concepts, that it, you know, it's only physical, it's only violent, and therefore those people who are masculine can't be political. Uh, you know, some setup to really warrant this claim, you know, because you, you said, you know, reinforcing this idea, well, you, you kind of have to enforce it beforehand. Um, secondly, on, on page 11, it says that uh, countering football's notions of masculinity and heteronormative, uh, heteronormativity, however, prove far more interesting to readers and critics alike. 
Queen expressed his support for gay marriage, um, sorry, marriage equality in both content and style. Now, again, this uh, this whole idea there is just like what I was saying, the whole uh, concept that you want to really establish this idea of masculinity as a as a construct being heteronormative. You see, I, I cannot see the idea of, for instance, a gay person being very masculine. You know, that idea is not foreign. So really, I, I think you need to do a little more work before you publish this on the idea that heteronormity and masculinity are inherently related. Okay, uh, moving on. Um, then you, you talk about um, this description uh, at page 10, the Cooley's willingness to bluntly engage the concept of gay sex and use all these descriptors he gave. Um, I don't know that I'm quite convinced that this shows really a comfortability with homosexuality because if you play sports in your locker room, you hear a lot of people saying these exact same things in more of a homophobic manner. So I don't know that a, a person's ability to use the term really justifies that a person's comfortable with homosexuality. Uh, so much as, you know, uh, for instance, I, I guess what I'm saying is homophobic people use these exact same terms, and clearly people who are homophobic are not comfortable. So a little more justification there would probably be good. Um, let's see. Th this whole concept of, of how he essentially queered football. Now, if I am understanding queering correctly, it's the idea that essentially what we're doing is taking heteronormative structures and pointing out that you know they are heteronormative and more importantly that gay people have a role in everyday life. I don't know that I agree that he's actually queering football here because he's not really saying that football you know makes gay normal or can you know make gayness normal. Um, so much as he's saying that it may be normal say for a um, a football player, the dumb jock stereotype, to actually be well informed, to actually be pretty liberal and progressive, and to actually be okay with gay marriage. It, I don't really I think he's queering football itself because he's not actually saying the sport or the masculinity of football actually acknowledges that you know, gay people are normal, you know, everyday uh, parts of life. Instead, he, uh, I think it's really more a critique on this dumb jock stereotype, which you know I, I think is what he was really getting after. Um, it, Emmett Burns about. Okay, um, this whole concept basically uh, of him posing in the magazine. I, I think this is kind of an interesting context, but I think you're you're getting a little too far away from the text here. Remember, you know, rhetorical criticism is the idea of you know, looking at the specific text, the letter. I, I think you drift a little too far in discussing his, his own body as a text. I mean, there, there's one thing to supplement it, but this whole idea, again, I think you're just trying to cram too much like, I think an entire paper might be able to be written on his appearance in Out Magazine, but I don't know how much of a place it really has here. Okay. Speaking of things uh, like that, um, I kind of felt this whole concept of, you know, whiteness and heterosexuality was, um, I don't know if it's the right word is crammed in, but it, it didn't seem to organically fit with the rest of the paper. I understand where you're going, but when I'm reading, you know, something looking at you know, critical rhetoric and how his paper can be understood as critical rhetoric, I, I don't quite get the uh, the, uh, the overall relevance of that. Um, but I, I do see your point, the idea essentially that his privilege allowed him uh, to speak a little more than, you know, other people might have. Um, you say on uh, page 17, it is impossible to ignore the fact that it took a white heterosexual athlete to speak up against an unjust letter and to be one, a person who his voice is very clearly heard. It's kind of a weak argument, I think, because uh, at, at the point where you're making that argument, you're basically saying, oh, you know, Ian Badeo was unable to make it because he wasn't a white heterosexual, you know, man. He, he didn't have that, you know, a uh, body that's not interrogatable, or I don't know if it's a proper word. Um, yet, also, you, you still mentioned that, uh, you know, I'm Badeo, I really hope I'm saying that right, um, didn't use profanity in his letter. Now, if, if that's the case, then what we see here is, is it really the fact that he's white that allows him to do this? For instance, had the other guy, um, Ian Badeo, uh, had that guy been um, able to actually use profanity, use the lustful cock monster and all the other colorful phrases that Chloe uses, uh, had he been able to do this, I, I, you know, I don't know that he wouldn't have garnered the same level of tension. 
I, I don't know uh, particularly what race he is, but I imagine, you know, with the last name like that, he's probably not Caucasian. However, I don't know that, you know, he wouldn't have garnered the same level of, you know, same attention that Chloe did had he used such colorful phrases. Because I, I really don't think it's the idea that Chloe was a white heterosexual male so much, it, well, heterosexual maybe, but a white male that allowed him to do this. In fact, uh, you, you talk about the idea of white privilege justifying the ability to curse. If you remember when they passed Obamacare and Joe Biden, who I love for the amount of gaps the guy makes, uh, Joe Biden specifically said, you know, until a live microphone to an international audience, that uh, when he approached uh, President Obama, he said, this is a big fucking deal. Now, when he said that, you know, everybody was shocked. Now, clearly, Joe Biden is the essence of white privilege. But because he was, you know, so privileged and because, you know, he was a white man, people didn't expect this to come from him. And it became the type of thing that comedians made fun of. So I, I don't buy this idea that essentially because a person has white privilege that they can get away with these things. If you look at, you know, pop stars, specifically, you know, musical artists, we see that, you know, African American people, Hispanic people, especially in music, get away saying a lot worse things than you would ever expect from, you know, maybe people with white privilege. So at the very least, we don't judge them for it. We don't think it's, you know, a bad thing. They're, you know, somehow they're not punished for not having white privilege and their ability to use profanity. So all told, you know, I, th I think this paper has a lot of potential. Uh, just, you know, a couple things that I, I think you definitely need to work on. Uh, first and foremost, um, you know, you need to justify why this piece is worthy of study, not just for Minnesotans and how it affected uh, people, the people of Minnesota, but how it affected the national discourse. Uh, secondly, less on Macero, more on queer theory, because you really need to explain that, especially in concepts of masculinity and heteronorm or heteronormativity, and how those two, you know, very hard to pronounce terms actually work together. Uh, third, when you know, a couple of your examples, I guess it, part of it's my debate background. You have a lot of claims and you have a lot of data. What I'm really not seeing here is a lot of warrant. And if you have those warrants, just those little small things, I think you can make this a really great paper. I think it's uh, definitely a, pu or a publishable paper. And I, for one, actually applaud you for actually uh, including the you know, very colorful language in there. You know, it may be a little hard to search if you're, you know, at a school search engine with, or any type of uh, you know, firewall that looks for uh, profanity. But in general, the fact is the profanity is really what made this interesting. And, you know, I would love to see a little more focus on that. And not so much the idea that his white privilege got away with it, but the idea that, you know, um, uh, he was, you know, able to use profanity to really paint the picture. Uh, the last thing I'd really like to see, you know, you discuss is this idea, and I, I did, or believe I brought this up in the first uh, critique of your justification, is the idea of his celebrity status uh, functioning, you know, uh, as well in this. The idea that essentially people listened to him because he was a celebrity. Maybe not because he was white, maybe not because he was heterosexual, or because, you know, he, he fit the realm of masculine man. Because I'm, I'm pretty sure I could take a person who looked identical to Chris Cooley, who was not a football player, who could send the exact same letter, and no one would really pay attention. The other probably would never even publish it because of the profanity. So the fact was, it was his celebrity status as a football player uh, that allowed him to even get in the discourse in the first place. And you know, maybe that would uh, go with the critique of freedom or essentially a, really a domination. How that's really reaffirming domination that the only reason we're willing to listen to this person is because he's good at a masculine sport. So all put together, I thought it was a pretty good paper. Uh, if you uh, fix those areas, um, I, I think you're, you're definitely on to something really, really good. Uh, thank you very much. I've enjoyed reading your papers over the course of the class. And uh, that will be it.